In woodworking, there are various tips and tricks you can explore to further your knowledge. However, in my opinion, finding tips that are actually useful in the real world, then learning how to perform those tricks using your own tools, and then finding a project or a process where you can actually implement that tip somewhat difficult. I believe it is far more effective to understand the principles and the fundamentals of any given process in woodworking. In this instance, sawing, because understanding a process is far more effective than simply relying on rote memorization of some random tips and tricks. This will allow you to work more safely, more efficiently, and of course, more accurately as well. So with that in mind, let's get into principle number one, which is positioning. More specifically, your stance, your grip, and your line of sight. Now, seeing as we're talking about principles here, the lessons I'm about to share with you apply across all different saw types, whether that's a dovetail saw, whether it's a carcass saw, whether it's a tenon saw, or whether it's a honking great panel saw like this. If you're working with Japanese saws, however, there may be a few subtle differences here and there, but we'll talk about that as we go along. So what we're aiming to do in this video is cut to these lines, which is comprised of two parts cutting square across the end grain and then cutting plumb. The first thing we wanna do here is make sure your elbow, wrist and spine are all in line with one another. This is very important as it allows the saw to track straight in the cut. And also what you'll find is the things I'm about to share with you later naturally fall into place. If instead of tracking straight, your elbow is kinked out like this, what you'll find is the saw will naturally curve out like that. Likewise, if it was tucked in for whatever reason, it's gonna start coming in towards you like that. Making sure it's all in line will not only be comfortable, but you'll also be able to cut a lot straighter. A very common problem people have with this is that they stand in front of the saw and you can already hear that that has made a difference to the cut and not in a good way. There can be exceptions to this, however. With a Japanese saw, some people will stand straight on just because the handle shape and length allows it. But even with Japanese saws, I like to get everything in line just because I feel like I get the most control from that. So just to summarize, you're pretty much standing perpendicular to the bench. You're gonna twist your body round, get everything in line, and then just do long strokes. That's gonna naturally get your body out of the way, and it's gonna get everything in line. Now, line of sight is very, very important when sawing, because at the end of the day, most of the time we're trying to cut to a line. But when I was taught to do this, I was taught to look over the spine of the saw, which I really struggled with. Don't get me wrong, there are merits to doing this, and it is something you need to do but don't take it too literally. Don't feel you need to do it all the time. The advantages to looking over the spine of the saw is that it allows you to very easily see if you're cutting square, which is something you can't really do if you're looking at it from the side. This is very similar to the lessons I shared in my how to chisel correctly video. If you haven't seen that already, there's a link up here. Positioning your line of sight in an optimal position can do wonders for cutting square. But as you'll see in principles I'll share with you later, there are merits to coming out of that position as well. So next we're gonna start focusing on grip. And this is gonna comprise of both gripping the saw and what to do with your other hand. Now, the first thing to remember is that these saws are designed to be gripped with three fingers, your pinky, ring finger, and middle finger. Those will go around the handle, whereas your index finger will point down the blade. The first thing you'll notice with this is it is way more comfortable. If you go for a full fist grip, everything is crammed in there. They're not designed for that. You'll also find it will stabilize the saw a lot more and keep it tracking straight. If you go for a full fist grip, just by simply varying the grip strength I'm applying to the saw, the whole thing's wobbling. If you point an index finger down, that doesn't happen as much. And that leads very nicely onto grip strength. I'm gonna do a magic trick for you here. I'm gonna hold onto this saw with one finger. Watch. Yeah, how about that? Technically, your middle finger is all you need to grip the saw. The rest of your fingers, simply there for support. To demonstrate this, I can literally let go of the saw with all of my fingers and just let the saw do the work. And this is a lesson that applies across all saws, whether it's something like a dovetail saw or whether it's something as big as a panel saw like this. Of course, you're gonna to need to grip something like this slightly harder if you're ripping down massive lengths compared to a dovetail saw. The takeaway from this is only grip a saw as much as you need to. Don't feel like you need to squeeze and grip the living daylights out of a saw because not only will that be incredibly uncomfortable, but also it'll just impede the performance of the saw. Now we've talked a lot about body positioning and grip of the saw. Now let's talk about what to do with the remaining hand. This is very, very crucial because it helps guide the most important cut, the initial one. 
Now, a lot of people get worried they might cut themselves when they do this, but don't worry. Your thumb has a natural round over that will clear it of the curve of the saw. The saw is either going to run against the end of your thumb or against your thumbnail, whichever sticks out the furthest. As long as you're not pushing into the saw, which to be honest will have problems beyond cutting your thumb because you'll literally be bending the plate. All that's needed with this is light pressure from the side. What you'll also find here is you can slightly roll your thumb forwards and backwards to micro adjust the position of the saw. Now, my personal preference here is to put my thumb on the back corner of the wood so that I can see the entire line I'm cutting to. Some people will put their thumb here, which is fine, but for me, I like putting it there. So I'm gonna slightly roll it forwards and backwards to get the saw in a position to cut on the right-hand side of that line. And once I'm happy with it, I'm gonna do a short stroke forwards and then work the line from back to front. There's a reason I do that and I'll share it later. But once the saw is fully engaged in the cut, I can remove my thumb and focus on cutting plum. Hey, that rhymes. Now I said earlier that I don't like permanently looking over the spine of the saw. Instead, I like to alternate between looking over the spine and looking at the side. This is an instance where you can start doing that. Take a look at the reflection of the wood in the saw plate. You'll notice that if I tilt the saw slightly wrong, a kink will appear in the wood. Likewise, if I get the angle wrong, a kink will also appear. You can use this reflection to your advantage when starting the cut and throughout the cut instead of relying solely on looking over the spine of the saw. This can be extremely useful when cutting thin components like this where you haven't got as much of a line to reference the saw along. By simply relying on the reflection of the saw, you can get an insanely accurate initial cut. Now, so far we've talked a lot about positioning, grip and general setup. Next, we're gonna begin tying all of that together and apply it to some actual practice. So a couple of things I haven't already mentioned. Firstly, make sure the wood is nice and low in the vise. If it's too high, you're gonna get a lot of unnecessary vibration. And secondly, make sure that when you're practicing how to cut square and plumb, the wood is level in the vise. You do not want variation in the angle while you're practicing how to cut plumb. It will make things so much more difficult. Now, the first thing we're gonna focus on is something I see people do all the time, and they do it with the expectation of it helping them out when in most cases it does the opposite. Saws are designed to cut on the push stroke, but many people struggle starting a saw by pushing. And we'll talk about why that is and how we can fix it in a moment, but just bear with me. And so what they'll do to get around this is instead of pushing forward to start the cut, they'll drag back. That sound you hear there is the teeth jumping up and down in the cut. And very conveniently, it's creating lots of divots that are the same shape and size as the teeth. This makes it very, very difficult to start the saw because it's no longer cutting into a smooth, flat surface. It's cutting into a serrated one. And so what happens is when you go to do the push stroke, the teeth lock into those grooves and then shoot forward because you're feeling the saw binds, which makes you push it harder, which makes you grip it harder. All sorts of things start falling out the window. What you'll find with sawing is that a lot of these techniques have to work in unison with one another because if one of them starts failing, the rest of them fail. But on the other hand, when they all come together, it can be a very, very pleasurable experience. But you're only going to experience that if you're using the saw as it was intended. And the saw was intended to cut on the push stroke. That is what's going to get you the smoothest start, and that's what will give you the best result. Sure, it will take a little bit of practice, but it will be worth it. Because the only way you can start on the push stroke is by employing the principles I've already told you. Good posture, good grip. If you're doing that, starting on the push stroke will be a breeze. But if you really can't get out of the habit, I would strongly suggest you get yourself a Japanese saw. These things cut on the pull stroke, which gives them many advantages over a traditional Western style saw. Not the least of which is being easier for beginners to use. If you're interested, I've put a few recommendations for these as well as my saws in the description below. Now cutting to lines can be very difficult, both for beginners and even advanced woodworkers alike. And a common reason for this is when people start their saw, they commit to cutting both lines at once. Not only have we got to get the cut square across the end grain, but we've got to make sure the tilt is correct as well. What can make this much easier is cutting the process down into two stages. Firstly, we're going to focus purely on cutting square across the end grain. And then once we've done that, we're going to focus on cutting plum. The way you do that is this. You'll notice earlier that I lifted the saw up to take out the back corner of the wood. This is advantageous because you're only focusing on one point of the line at a time, rather than going in flat like this and trying to hit the entire thing at once. Get your saw into a position where the reflection looks good and slightly elevate it. Push forwards to take out the back corner and then just do little strokes while blowing away the dust to make sure you're tracking that line from back to front. You can make small turns as you go 
and slightly lower the saw until the entire thing is engaged in the end grain. You can also do the opposite to this if you find it more comfortable by starting on the front edge and nodding the saw forwards. If anything, starting on the front like that and nodding it forward is the better option because you're technically cutting with the grain, but that's a little bit out the scope of this video. For now, just take my word, you can either start on the back and bring it down like this or start on the front and bring it forwards. Now you'll notice by the reflection there is a little bit of tilt, but that doesn't matter. The cut is shallow enough for me to still adjust that. All I've focused on at the moment is getting a nice square cut along the end grain, which is what I've got. So now we've got that, I can get the saw locked in that and focus purely on the tilt. A couple of things to look out for when doing this. Make sure you're not pushing down too hard on the saw because it will start bending the plate and then that's gonna start throwing the saw off the line it also will start causing you to grip harder, which is already a thing we've discussed. And lastly, make sure you're using long strokes. You purchased each and every one of these teeth, use them. Because if you don't do long strokes, you start doing little ones like this, you start getting impatient, so you push harder, and then the saw starts bending, and then you diverge away from your line. Like I said earlier, a lot of things with sawing work in unison with one another. When you start doing long strokes, you'll find you naturally relax, you'll find you naturally get in the right position, you'll find your hand won't hurt as much, and you'll find you won't detension the saw plate, which is quite annoying when that happens. If you take anything from this section, use all of the teeth on the saw because when you fail to do that, the entire system cascades. It's a very simple fix and will have huge advantages to your technique, not to mention the lifespan of the saw itself. The challenge, should you choose to accept it, is to now put as many cuts in the end grain down to that baseline without any of them joining up. This relies on perfectly square cuts along the end grain and it obviously relies on perfectly plumb cuts down to the baseline. Let's see how many cuts I can get in this. All right, we're doing pretty good so far. Let's halve these. Oh man, okay. <laughs> oh no! Ah, oh, rubbish. And so that is how to saw correctly. If you're looking for more specific information on Japanese saws, I'd recommend taking a look at Jonathan Katz Moses video. There's a link to that in the description below, as well as my favorite Japanese saw, which is the Gaiokochu 372. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.